and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision session with me, Christine. So in this lesson, I'm going to look at nucleotides and that's part of your module two, 2.1.3. Okay, so if we look at a nucleotide structure then, there's a few things we have to understand. First of all, a nucleotide is made up of three parts, a nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar and a phosphate group. So if we look at the pentose sugar then, it's important to note that there are two types of pentose sugars, the DNA, which is deoxyribose, or the ribose sugar. Now, what is different between these is they are both pentose sugars, so they both have five carbons. However, what if we look at carbon number two, what we can clearly see is that in the deoxyribose, D means removal, oxy, there is one less oxygen present at that carbon number two. Whereas in ribose, that still has the correct number of oxygen. So that is called a ribose sugar. So that's one of the distinguishing features between a nucleotide is what is the pentose sugar actually made of? Now, normally, if they're going to show it as a diagram, they will show it with the hydroxyl group. If there is no line coming down from carbon two, you assume that that is missing the hydroxyl group and therefore that would signify a deoxyribose that is present. Now the next thing we need to look at is our nitrogenous basis. So when we look at deoxyribonucleic acid, we are looking at our nucleotides which have our deoxyribose sugar and they have a potential of four nitrogenous bases. They can have adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Now, what you have to understand is that the difference between these nitrogenous bases is for you to note whether it has a double ring. If it has a double ring, then that is called a purine. So purines have a double ring, and I love using the alphabet to help me. So if you look at the word purine, it has a U in it. Well, double also has a U in it. Therefore, the purines have got the double ring. So my adenine and my guanine are purines because they are double rings. Now, pyrimidines have a single ring. So because they've got a single carbon ring, the pyrimidines are your thymines and your cytosines. So again, I like to use my alphabet to help me here. I look at my pyrimidine has a Y in it. Thymine and cytosine also have Ys in their name. Therefore, that's my link in to remind myself that my thymine and my cytosine are pyrimidines, therefore making my adenine and guanine my purines. I remember my purines have my double ring and therefore my pyrimidines have to have the single ring. So there are four nitrogenous bases in our DNA nucleotides. Well, remember, we also have the ribose pentose sugar and we can have a ribose nucleotide. So the only difference in the ribose nucleotide is they have a ribose pentose sugar, but also they do not have thymine. Instead, they have the pyrimidine, which is called uracil. So RNA can be made up of an adenine nitrogenous base, a guanine nitrogenous base, a cytosine nitrogenous base, but they have uracil instead of thymine. So another distinguishing feature between whether we're looking at a DNA nucleotide or an RNA nucleotide is that nitrogenous base. So another thing to talk about when we look at DNA is the fact that DNA is negatively charged. Now that's because of the phosphate group. The phosphate group has a negative charge to it and that therefore makes the molecule negatively charged. Now because these nucleotides are small, it means that they are able to dissolve and move around within the aqueous solution inside the cell. So that is an important factor for us to note and it will come into play when we look at gel electrophoresis in module six in your A-level content. So what we now need to look at is our what's known as our complementary base pairs. So adenine and thymine always complement each other with hydrogen bonds. The pyrimidine and the purine always come together and they form two hydrogen bonds. Now, because we know that uracil is 
basically the same structure as the thymine, it means that it can also make these two hydrogen bonds with adenine. So therefore, the complementary base pairing, if we were looking at RNA, if there is an adenine present, then uracil will complementary base pair. Guanine and cytosine also complementary base pair, and they complementary base pair by producing three hydrogen bonds between the two nitrogenous bases. Again, I love using little tricks to help me to remember. So cytosine starts with the C. C is the third letter of the alphabet. Therefore, cytosine always makes three hydrogen bonds with the guanine and adenine and thymine make two. So the next thing we need to talk about is also a nucleotide, but this nucleotide is the energy currency within the cell. So adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency within the cell and that is made up of an adenine attached to a ribose and this time it is a triphosphate because there are three phosphates attached. Adenosine diphosphate again is an adenine nitrogenous base, a ribose sugar with two phosphates attached. So these are nucleotides and the differing part of this nucleotide is that it only has an adenine as the nitrogenous base and it has a differing number of phosphates attached to the fifth carbon. So if we look at DNA then, we know that DNA is made up of a double helix. We know that it's actually made up of two anti-parallel polynucleotide strands. So we've just talked about the fact that the nitrogenous bases will form complementary base pairing by producing hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. Well, the hydrogen bonds are between the two strands, whereas the adjacent nucleotides are held together by phosphodiester bonds. So please do check out my DNA replication video, which goes through how those phosphodiester bonds are formed. But the phosphodiester bonds are between the adjacent nucleotides in one polynucleotide strand, whereas the hydrogen bonds are between the nitrogenous bases between the two strands. Now we know that DNA has a double helix, so we do know that the two strands of nucleoti nucleotides are actually twisted around one another to form that double nucleotide helix. So what's important for us to note is that there are 10 bases in each turn of the spiral. And that helps to stabilize and pull the sugar phosphate out so it is separated enough to be a stable molecule. So the next thing we need to note is how do we actually purify DNA by using precipitation? Well, in my lesson where I talked about nitrogenous bases, annoyingly, So now we need to look at the purification of DNA by precipitation. Now in my lesson on biological membranes, I did talk about the fact that solvents have an effect on membranes. So detergent is used to break down a plasma membrane and to break down a nuclear membrane because those hydrophobic tails are able to insert themselves into the lipid bilayer and disrupt its structure. But whenever we do purification of DNA, we always actually do it with plant cells rather than animal cells. So first of all, we need to actually break apart the cell wall. That strong cellulose cell wall needs to be broken for us to be able to access the plasma membrane and the nuclear membrane. So whenever we do this, we first would grind our sample up. So here I'm grinding up some strawberries to break the cell wall and then I've added in some detergent so I used some washing up liquid and that then broke down that plasma and nuclear membrane. 
Now, the next thing you have to then do is neutralize the charge of the DNA. Remember that phosphate group has a negative charge to it, so the DNA molecule is negatively charged. Well, we want to neutralize that charge, and we do that by adding in salt. That's gonna make the DNA sugar phosphate backbone less soluble in the water. And then what we need to do is, because we're looking at plant cells, and those plant cells are eukaryotic, we need to break down those histone proteins which are associated with the DNA molecule. So to do that, we use a protease enzyme and that protease enzyme is going to digest, is going to hydrolyze those histone proteins and therefore release that DNA. Then what we need to do is we filter it and then we use alcohol. So the alcohol is a non-polar solution and what that will do is that will therefore cause the DNA to come out of the solution and form a precipitate. DNA is polar whereas the alcohol is non-polar and that will therefore allow for this separation out. Now it's a very difficult procedure to do so you can't really see very clearly the DNA that I tried to precipitate out. So you may have done this as a PAG, you may not have done this in your lesson, but these are the key bits you need to know if you're going to be asked a question on it. Why do you need to use detergent? Why do you need to use salt? Why protease enzyme and why alcohol? And they are the important parts for us to be able to purify the DNA sample. If you like this video, then please do click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you haven't done so already, check out my revision platform, www.aiqchat.com. It will help you with your revision.